We're just going to give everybody an opportunity to uh, come on in and we will get started. Well, welcome again. My name is Deborah Levine, and I am here representing the School of Public Health and Health Policy. And this is our skills building webinar series. And we thank you all for coming and joining us. Today, we have the distinct pleasure of a absolute phenomenal subject matter expert, Jay. Blackwell, who will be sharing with us his skips and tips around Grant Writing 101 and all the good stuff that you need to know. Um, this webinar will be going from 1 to 2.30, and we will be sure to include a section in here where you're able to ask your questions. Please feel free to use the chat. We will ask that folks uh, remain on mute and when you want to ask questions, if you would raise your hand, just so that we can keep track of it all. Um, again, I just want to thank you all for signing up and being a part of this. We are excited about being able to share this great information. So Jay, without further ado, I will decrease so that you can increase in this process and we can get started. Very well, and thank you very much, Deborah. And I want to um, thank uh, City University of New York and the uh, School of Public Health for inviting me to share this information. Uh, my name is Jay Blackwell, and I'm coming to you today from Albuquerque, New Mexico. The topic that we are really um, here to focus on is how to get you money. Um, this is about how to make sure that your ideas are ones that are fundable and they are ideas that can enact change within your communities. Um, I've been working in public health for about 30 years, give or take. So um, before that, I had uh, folks who kept me in the community. So I not only understand what it means to be um, a steward of the community, but also what it means to have to raise money for this kind of stuff. And that's where I'm coming to you today. This information has been born out of my experience as a grant writer um, who's been successful, as a grant reviewer who still gets called to um, review grants for agencies that are both foundations and um, public funds, your tax dollars, feds, states, and even some counties have asked me. And I'm also coming from this to this information to bring you from the perspective of a grant writer, someone who cares about their community and someone who's ready to do something about change. And um, actually, that is one of, one of the key words that I really want to emphasize throughout this presentation. It's about change. People don't give out money because uh, they want things to stay exactly the same as they have always been. So it's about how you as a writer are able to clearly distinguish what's changing in your community as a result of outside support. Outside support can be money, that can be volunteers, that can be materials, that can be a new building, that can be a, a cleaner sidewalk, that can be transportation, you know, resources. This is all about resources and how you as a grant writer will know how to look at an application differently so that you can express the correct terms to speak to your funder. So uh, let me just kind of get started. I thought I had my arrow here. I have my presentation off to the side. So in this workshop, basically gonna be two areas. 
Um, it's going to be about an hour long, a little bit over, and then we will still have time to ask questions. We'll still have time to like delve into the details. And yes, we can do some of the details. I just have to make sure we can get through this in the time allotted. This is for you. The first area is about your ideas, about your ideas as a writer. It's about how a funder puts out applications and how you as a writer have to bridge these ideas to the application resulting in change. Again, we are talking about change. Now, if we're talking about change, that means that you have to have a great idea about your starting point. Do you know what your baseline data is? Do you have a baseline? Do you need a baseline? What does a baseline look like? These are terms, please, if you don't know a term, um, when it comes to time for questions, that's a great one to ask. For those of you who have questions along the way, please, um, as, uh, as our sister Levine has uh, shared, you can uh, raise your hand and then put those into the format. Okay, part two. Part two is about the applications. It's about funding mechanisms and um, how to get funded. So before we begin, it will be very helpful for you as participants to at least have one funding idea that you would like to see supported, just one. And use this one funding idea throughout this presentation. And you'll see, hopefully, you'll begin to see how um, the information that is shared can support your um, being able to better speak to a funder in that funder's terms. And I'm being very broad here. So let's just get to it. All right, so we have this, let's go to this next slide. So this information is being presented to you um, in a form that, um, it's a teaching form that I actually um, have been working with about 20 years now, and it's called VDC. V stands for vision. D is for design. C is for capacity. And by that, I mean the capacity of your agency to do the work. This approach to grant writing helps you to look, helps you as a writer to look at any application that comes across your desk. It helps you as a writer to formulate your ideas to speak about resource development versus grant writing. There's resource development and then there's grant writing. And even though we're talking about grant writing today, you're still gonna hear a little bit about resource development. So in um, grant writing, the grant writer, now. Let me just give you a little bit of background. Um, when I was um, working in DC, one of I, I was asked to participate in a grant review to become a grant reviewer. Um, behind the scenes, I learned so much about grant writing, just hanging out with the grant reviewers. And one of the first things that I found was that they did not respect many of the applications that were coming through. Um, to my surprise, grant reviewers were poking fun at many applications they didn't understand and it just pissed me off. But I listened, I hung in there and I also called them on their stuff, on their biases. Um, in the meantime though, this is what you get. This vision, this design and capacity piece, every application that you're ever going to have to construct will have a vision component to it. Basically saying, what do you want to do? What do you want to do with our money? Our money is what the funder wants to share. And I want to be very specific. I'll say it again. Funders want to give out their money. That's why they're there. That's why they have applications. It's a matter of you, the grant writer, being clear about what is changing. Are you, as a writer, communicating a clear vision for change? 
And this is something that we will really hope to share in the first part of what we do. Now that's the V, that's the vision, a vision for change. Next is the design portion. Every grant has um, a portion of it that says, how are you going to do that? What is your plan? That's your design. And writers, your design is based upon verbs. Verbs. Verbs carry the action of where the money goes. Are you going to support? Are you going to convene? Are you going to recruit? Are you going to produce? Writers, get a handle on your verbs. What are your verbs? What direction? Are your, are your verbs saying up? Are they saying down? Are they saying we're going to include? When you look at your writing style, you are able to get a much clearer um, indication of what you're trying to say is going to happen. So vision, V, what's your vision for change? D, design, how are you going to do it? What verbs are you going to use? And then C, capacity. There is always a component that says, how do we know as a funder that your agency is the best agency to receive this money? So let's flip that around. And you need to, in your applications, demonstrate how you have things called expertise, how you have things like connection to the community, how things that you, you have things like a place or a space or the ability or the drive. Now, this is still based upon your verbs. This is still based upon your words. How are you crafting? How are you thinking about what you're telling, what you want to tell a funder? Because before you get to that application, this is stuff that you need to have in your head. And you also need to be ready to hash it out kind of like on your computer. So V, D, and C, vision. Are you communi communicating a clear vision for change? D, do you have a design process? Are your verbs together so that they are logical and they can follow, people can follow what's happening? And then C, how are you demonstrating your capacity and readiness to take this money? We're gonna talk about that next, actually. Um, um, the second part, we're gonna talk about things that need to be that according to this VDC approach, um, it makes for a strong, stronger application when um, you as a writer can, one, talk about intentional change over time. So if you recall, um, just a couple of minutes ago, I asked you to think about a project that you want to get funded. This is where I want you to put these thoughts into intentional change over time. If, if you were to put that word, intentional change over time looks like, then that's what a winning grant application needs to be focused around. With your idea, intentional change over time, and your idea looks like, we're also going to be addressing the writer, the grant reviewer, and the funder. We'll be talking about your technical caca. And for those of you who are too young to know what caca is, we'll, we'll share that later too. Uh, we're also gonna talk about um, the differences between priorities over tasks in an application and um, success. Success is one of those key words that if you are not able to define and say that your agency is going to be successful with um, somebody else's money, then somebody else puts their money to those who know and can guarantee success. So as a key word in your grants, please let me as a grant writer know what does success look like with the funder's money. This is where we go back to vision. This is also 
where we go back to intentional change over time. And speaking of time, I need to get moving with this presentation. All right, next one, part one, vision. Vision, elements, and grants and proposal. proposals. So this whole thing about VDC, this VDC approach says, most writers don't spend time developing their ideas. When you have a winning application, that's because I, as a grant reviewer, understood where you were going. I, as a reviewer, um, you know, you provided me with some of the basic data that I needed because my job as a grant reviewer, I have one job, one job only. I either do A or B. A, it goes up to the funder for their review. B is to say those applications that will get a thank you, but no thank you, not this time around. So I'm focusing today on these A applications. These A applications have very strong vision elements. Vision elements means that they are able to say what specific changes or results are going to occur once the money takes place. Once the money or exchanges has occurred, this is what happens, specific. In your minds, in the minds of a grant reviewer, specific is much better than general because for a funder, a report is much better if it's specific than is a report generally what I think we did with your money. So vision elements, please take time to develop a point to what happens because of activities, what specific changes are going to occur. Evidence of expertise. Expertise exists in your staff. Expertise exists within your field. Expertise exists within your partners. Expertise exists within how do you show that you, that you have the expertise to connect with your community? Because um, uh, as a reviewer, I have seen many applications that talk about we will go there and with them, we will do this to them. Expertise says that, oh, they have to develop a relationship there. So since there are agencies that actually do exist that serve a community already, they will hopefully highlight their existing expertise and connections to those communities. Please let us know how your agency is important to the communities that you serve. Let, the, let your application demonstrate how you are, um, how you know, you know who works on what corner or who or what stores are available to partner with. That's important. That allows the grant reviewers to understand that there is a clear connection to how this money is going to be spent. And it actually reduces the amount of time that has to be spent in connecting with the community. Evidence-based inter interventions, EBIs. Now we hear that all the time. Um, and sometimes we have a hard problem saying, well, you know, I don't have any evidence-based interventions. Um, this is when you are really, it's really good to like reach out to the funder um, and ask the funder, are there any preferred evidence-based interventions that they have seen work within communities over the years? Blah, blah, blah. Some funders really enjoy that extra contact to know that, oh, this is a responsive person. This is someone who not only has a vision, but they also want to see what we supported in the past. Sometimes that is on the funder's website. Sometimes it is not. So um, in your vision, um, oh, back to uh, EBIs. Um, if you are unable to find a uh, evidence-based intervention that supports the type of activities that you um, want to initiate in the community, then you can do what is called um, an informed process, evidence-informed. Um, evidence-informed means that it, it has not been officially evaluated, which does cost a bit of money to um, demonstrate the effectiveness within community A or community B or community C. But to say that your um, proposal or that your process has been informed by data, that counts. 
It most certainly does. And it's a part of the vision that you really kind of want to plant with um, subliminal words within your application to inspire trust within the funder and also within the grant reviewer. Um, success is an example of a subliminal word. If I see or read success in an application, I'm more likely to trust it versus an application that does not mention success, that does not mention with clarity that we know that an agency knows how to use correctly the money that it, it has promised to um, use in part of the community. That's EBI versus a, um, evidence-informed intervention. So something new. If you're approaching this in a new way, please include it in the application. Don't hold on to that information to yourself. Let the grant reviewers know that you have a novel way of addressing an existing issue within your community. Um, something new might be that you have a new partner. Something new could be a new vision. Um, in my agency in, in Albuquerque, um, we do behavioral health, which used to be called mental health. Um, and we do behavioral health from an Afrocentric viewpoint. Afrocentric, you say, you can only work with black people if it's Afrocentric. Well, I don't know. Does psychoanalysis only work with Austrians um, who are male? No, um, Afrocentric is an approach. This approach piques people's interest and we know how to write about it because we also have data that we can say informs success, something new a different approach to how you are addressing an existing issue. If there is that in, in your proposal, highlight it, bring it up to the top. Let us know how you as an agency, you as a community are prepared to move differently. And then successful outcomes and who will care? What's your vision? Your vision is in the outcome. What are outcomes? Outcomes are benefits. Benefits to a person, benefits to a family, benefits to a community, benefits to a building, benefits to the environment, benefits to a park. Those are all successful outcomes. Outcomes are always about benefits. We're going to get there later. I'm going to say that again. So this next piece of the presentation that you see at the, at the bottom has like three different quadrants. In the third quadrant, inclusive designs and voices, systemic accountability, relationships, and sustainability. These sections almost always stay throughout the vision, design, capacity, and, and approach. Because as a writer, you always wanna have these things within your writing. Within your proposal, these are the elements that speak directly to the grant reviewer. The funder focuses on what's up top, the changes, the evidence of expertise, the um, EBIs, the um, is it new and then what's the benefits. That's what a funder wants to know. The grant reviewer, we're checking to see inclusive designs and voices. Are consumers part of your ideas? Have you invited them to the table? How have you included the voice of those who will be um, benefiting from these services? Systemic accountability. In your application, do you show accountability to your clients? Do you show accountability to your staff? Do you show accountability to the money? Account, you can, in any, any application, it takes three or four sentences to write how you are showing accountability to the money. If you want to know what I mean, um, in your studies now, check out the term GAP. It is an acronym, G-A-A-P, GAP. Um, for those of you uh, who have an accountant, and for, the, well, for those of you who don't have an accountant, you need to get one eventually. For those of you who do have an accountant or a CFO, ask them how GAP can be represented within your applications. I'm going to come back to that later, but that's part of accountability. 
that's to the that's accountability to the money. You also have to be accountable to your clients and you have to be accountable to your staff. Now, a lot of times in applications, you have to do a little checkbox that says, um, will you agree to abide by all of the city rules or the federal rules or all the state rules? That's part of accountability that you have to check. But there are other places that you can also include in the application. It doesn't take a lot of words. It takes a few sentences to like state how your agency wants to make sure that you know, safety is of importance um, and the outcomes and activities that your agency engages in. Relationships. Um, as a grant reviewer, we, all, we always want to know, is this um, idea that you have related to anything? Is it related to a, a city or a county initiative? Is it related to a state initiative? Is this something that we are seeing on a national scale? Is this, is this something that is only popping up right here? What's the relationship? Why is it important that uh, this idea of yours be funded? You know, like kind of relationship also means who cares. So this is also about benefits. So relationships and then sustainabilities. Sustainability, probabilities, possibilities, any indications of um, there may or may not be an opportunity to address sustainability within your application. Um, more than likely, it will be in the program narrative. Uh, and we will also share those pieces because I also want to like make sure that you as a writer know what each of the portions of a grant are and how this vision, design, and capacity relate to each of the parts of the grant. Um, so that's what's coming up. We have a lot to look for. So this is from the vision pieces of grants and applications and also resource development that we really encourage grant writers and those that are doing development work to understand what is your vision for change? Are you using words when you talk about your vision for change that are active words? Um, are you using words that are one day we will gonna have to hope that we can might maybe do? That doesn't breed confidence. So your writing style is something that develops every time you write a grant. Um, but to like sometimes it takes 10 grants, 10, you, you're writing 10 applications to get two or three grants and that's good, but you still have to write 10 applications. So your writing style, I just wanna encourage you to please um, don't give up, there's always more to learn, always more to learn. So let's talk about design now, that's going back to those verbs. So divine, um, design elements and grants and proposals, um, they are what really links expertise to your agency to action. Um, linking agency expertise, that means when you have experts, Experts or subject matter experts are, you know, we might know what to do. We know what to look for. That's why you want to make sure that in your design element, you are able to mention people or skills. And in one place, actually, you can list both. Um, design elements include SMART objectives and goals. Um, SMART, as I'm sure everyone on this call already knows and understands, SMART is an acronym for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Realistic, and Time-Based. Specific, how are you specific in what's changing? Measurable, do you have a number? You need a number for it to be SMART. Um, you can either do whole numbers, you can do rates, or you can do percentages, um, depending on what you're writing about. Um, is it attainable? Attainable means in the time frame, can you get it done? In two weeks, can you see 16,000 people? Depends on your agency. Realistic. Is it realistic or not? Can you do 16,000 people in two weeks? Depends upon your agency and time-based, two weeks. So this sounds a whole lot like um, uh, something that people really struggle with. 
But um, please know that there is help and assistance. That's also why you're going through this particular series of skill building trainings. Evaluation, understanding evaluation just at the minimal level does wonders for grant application. So um, I would really urge strong, compel um, you guys to continue to um, receive and do uh, more trainings around evaluation. I don't care how long you've been in the business or how short of a time, every little bit helps. So talk to Miss Levine about that and she'll make sure that that, gets, that, that happens a bit more. Um, Timelines and responsibilities. Um, there is all, there are most grants um, actually provide this as an outline for you. Um, what's changing? Who's responsible for it? Um, how do we know that it's been completed? When are you going to measure it? And who's responsible for it? Uh, and um, is this a particular indicator or whatnot? Uh, so that's part of the timelines and responsibilities. These are usually elements that are very much spelled out in a grant application. What would help you as a writer to prepare for that is to go back and like look at, again, your ideas. It's like, what's the first thing you want to do? What's the second thing? What's the third thing? Um, and then just going line by line saying, the first thing that we want to do is, it's going to be handled by it will take place during this amount of time. And then you have to figure out, is this a priority or is this a task? Is one a priority or is it a task? That's really up to you as a writer to decide. So then um, timelines and responsibilities, you've got to make sure that if, if you know, this is what we guess, we think that it's going to take six months to do A or B or C. Most applications, frankly, are asking you as a writer or you as an agency to give it your best guess. And that's what we ask you to do. Is that best guess based off of um, prior knowledge, prior activities, or um, how are you getting there? Um, as a writer, that's usually the backstory. That's usually not what funders want. Not usually, it depends on the application. Um, funders want that chart, that chart that says, we're going to do this task. Susie Q is going to be assigned to it. And Susie Q is going to take care of that by the third month of the application. Um, speaking about that, um, in a lot of timelines and work plans, uh, I really encourage you guys to switch to month one, month two, month three, and month four. Because um, when you uh, slot your applications with months like June, July, August, September, you know, what if the, you, you think that you'll get the money in May, but it doesn't get here until July. When it does get here, you're already two months behind. When you put month one, month two, month three, month four, that says uh, month one is when we get the money versus May or June when we expect to get it. If you can put your calendar, you're communicating to your funder what needs to happen in a systematic way. We need one month to do the first thing. We need two months to do the second thing. If you're going to shorten our calendar, then um, what we wrote, we want your money, but what we wrote needs to be changed. I hope that makes sense to you. Okay, and um, let's see, cohesion. Cohesion among the data, the activities, the products and the outcomes. Oh my word, um, I have a story. I, I hope I have enough time to share it. Okay, I'm gonna do it anyway. I had to review this grant one time. It really looked good. Um, in the grant application, this is for um, diabetic control. Um, and it was with a small community. They were doing diabetes control. And, and in it, some of their activities that they were doing included things like um, they were going to have a walk run. They were engaging in a walk run. They were engaging in marketing. And they were also engaging, see, it was the walk run materials. And then they were also doing, I think, some community presentations. All really wonderful stuff. Diabetes control, diabetes control. What they were doing, look at those verbs. Makes sense, right? Well, when it came to the budget, 
what they were doing was paying for gym memberships. They were paying for foot gear and they were paying for salaries. Now, anywhere in the application, did they say one thing about foot gear? Did they say one thing about gym memberships? No. Did it make sense? Sure. You know, if you have a process for that, but there has to be cohesion. If there's not cohesion between your budget, how the money is spent versus the activities that are in your work plan and your timeline, you do not have a winning grant. Anything in your budget has to explicitly be mentioned or further defined within your work plan, your timeline, and within your general narrative. Don't do a switch and bait in your applications, please. Don't say you want money for a race and then turn around in your budget and say this money is going to be, uh, is going to be allocated towards gym memberships. <sighs> It was a missed moment for that community. That's what I wanna talk about, cohesion. All the way through, it does not need to be any surprises. From the beginning to the end, keep it simple. Um, and, and this is, I'll tell you also why. As a grant reviewer, I'm required to read a whole lot of applications and in, if I have to read 12 applications and your application says you're doing two or three different things and none of it fits, I'm moving on. I'm gonna score you down low because there's no cohesion um, and you are uh, informing us of different processes. And I'm gonna go back to the application that does that, that does what it said it was going to do from the opening paragraph. So. Let's go on in design. Inclusive designs and voices. How are you including your consumers and stakeholders along the way as you do change? How are you accountable to your clients? How are you accountable to your staff and the money and the rules? Have you clearly shown in your work plan, in your timeline, how agencies are passing tasks, sharing tasks, making sure that clients can get from one agency to the next agency. Is that part of your verbs? Or is that part of your timeline as well? And um, sustainability practices, kind of iffy in a work plan, unless as part of that, you are going to show that you are going to use the last year or a year and a half to continue to look for ways to support these wonderful activities that you're engaging in. So that is the design elements. Remember, design elements work with your verbs. As another hint, your verbs drive your budget unless everybody is going to volunteer everything. Anytime that you have a major verb like disseminate information, collect data, there's a cost to that. So when you look at as a writer, when you look at your verbs and your priorities and your tasks, it helps you to figure out how much money needs to be spent and when. Verbs in your design drive your budget. Free tip. So let's go on to the capacity piece now. This is about your agency. Uh, let's see now. Capacity elements, um, and in capacity, please, please talk about success. And when I read your application as a grant reviewer, I want to make synonymous your agency's name and success. How have we have been successful by? Our agency is Umoja Behavioral Health. Umoja Behavioral Health has been successful by implementing an Afrocentric and feminist worldview, which allows people to come into therapy who have never sought it before. How are you successful? Pair success with your agency's name. From the beginning, please. This is talking about agency expertise. 
and authenticity. And authenticity of connection between your partners, your communities, populations, and our issues being addressed. You bet I want to hear this. Let me tell you something. Funders want, <laughs> funders want to give you money so they can also claim responsibility for your success. Because when you are successful with the funders money, that means that you've done some change in the world. And funders compete amongst themselves for impact. As part of impact, how are you showing a funder that you can bring it? You can bring the people, you can bring the data, you can bring the change that their money is out there to, you know, really put into the world. That's why they put these applications out so you can convince them to give you a piece of their pie. Authenticity of a connection between who is being changed and your agency, your agency, the capacity of your agency to bring about success. I need to hear that. Realistic timelines and ability of staff to meet deadlines. Don't tell me that you can reach 16,000 people in two weeks unless you've already done it once or you come close enough that you have a process that works. Now, um, I think I mentioned earlier, I'm in this you know, little town called you know, um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, where Bugs Bunny always gets lost. You know, reaching 16,000 people is a wholly different situation for me than 16,000 people might be in two weeks in some of your own locations. And you need to let me know that as a grant reviewer. Okay, please spend time and invest in that. Um, because I, I need to know as a funder how I can take responsibility for your success. Evaluation, detail, and expertise. Agencies, when you do this work, how do you know that you're successful? You, you know that you're successful by doing surveys, by doing evaluations, by doing things like having a, a sign-in sheet, things that you can point to that say, we captured these many people or we have this much influence. How do you measure your activities? How will you measure your activities? Um, and that is a capacity element. Now, for instance, a lot of people do focus groups. There's a difference between conducting a focus group and analyzing the information from a focus group. That's a capacity issue. So um, it, as an evaluation, you know, as capacity, you need to do focus groups, that's great. Do you now have the capacity to evaluate them? Do you have a partner who can evaluate them? How can you demonstrate your usefulness, your impact through numbers, through data? Data is important. And um, we also want to be recruiting for successful outcomes. Um, I'm going to rush a little bit because I've got about uh, 15 minutes more so that we can go to that next piece. Um, this is one of the last pieces here. We have the inclusive designs and voices, the relationships, paper trails, copies and permits of everything that is needed to operate and receive public or private um, funding. That's part of your capacity to show that you can have that. So what do you see in front of you now? I'm hoping you're going to see the nine parts of most grant applications. Um, and these are broken up into vision elements, design, elements and capacity elements. Now, one good thing, everybody, please know that this slide presentation is available to you. We only need you to complete the survey at the end. Um, the survey is gonna pop up. Not only are you gonna get this presentation, but I've also put together some wonderful resources um, for you to take home, go through, look through that I promise will be useful in helping you to consider um, how to beef up your applications. Um, we also will be hearing from um, one of our people resources in the city. Um, that's coming up next, but let's go back and focus on these nine parts of most grant applications. Almost any grant application that you have has vision components. Vision components are things like your letter of intent. Hey, funder, we want your money. That's a vision. We're going to do something good with it. The abstract of course, which is like written last and it has that, it's like that, that paragraph that talks really about what you're gonna do. Your program narrative, this is the story. This is what most people think about when they say, I'm gonna write a grant. 
they're thinking about the program narrative, how when you first say, this is what's going on, this is what we wanna do, this is how we know that this is an issue, here is our process, it'll take this amount of time to complete it, and we know we will be successful because this is what we're gonna do. That's the narrative. That's just one little component. That's part of your vision. To get the narrative working, you have your design elements. Now, one piece, is this organizational summary that is a design element that is usually a one page um, template language that describes your agency and how it has been successful up until today. And please, in your organizational statement, focus on success. This is a time when you truly need to brag you can brag about your agency expertise. You can brag about your staff. You can brag about your connection to the community. You can just brag and brag and brag because I, as a reviewer and a funder, need to know how you're going to be successful. I need success in there somewhere. And that design, this is it's actually a design element. How have you intentionally conducted activities in such a way that we can tell that you've been successful in the world. That's your organizational summary. That's what that one page needs to summarize, okay? Other design elements include your program description. This is the same thing as a work plan or a timeline. Um, particularly for public grants, public grants are like grants from the city, the state, the county. These are the feds, federal money. This is public money. Public money is generated through taxes, through the tax base. Then you have private money. Private money are like foundations. Private money are like your neighbors, your friends, your family. I mean, churches are some of the biggest recipients of private donations, but foundations are also really big too. So um, in public versus private foundations, in public, in, in, in public um, applications, they most always, they almost always give you a outline to complete for your work plan or your timeline. Sometimes private agencies will do that. Sometimes they don't. Um, if they don't, um, you can always like find them online um, or um, go back to one of the other grants to get your columns about how you want to talk about who does what, when, where, and why, and how long. That's part of your design. And then evaluation methodology. Part of evaluation is design. Which one are you gonna choose? Are you gonna do focus groups? Are you gonna do ad administrative record keeping? Are you going to do a post assessment or pre and post assessment? That's the design. But the analysis part is your capacity. So evaluation methodology, methodology has both design and capacity. Other pieces of capacity includes how you complete your budgets and your fiscal responses. And they also include the attachments. That's your capacity or ability to complete all those check marks. So this is really what most applications are looking for. It's an application, but what they don't have is frankly your brilliance, your creativity, your um, insistence on change. So it's, please know it is about your ideas. As a writer, we are asking you to please focus on your ideas first before you uh, go to any application. You can look at an application, sure. Go through it, read it two, three times before you write the first word. When you look through an application, begin to see, are they asking, is this a design issue or a question? Is this a vision question? Or are they trying to get to um, understand what is the capacity of our agency to, to be successful? Vision, design, capacity. This is included in almost every or any uh, application you're gonna to get to. All right, I gotta move, I'm talking too much. All right, funders want more. Always, funders want more. They want to know that your work, your ideas are mission-driven, outcome-focused, 
that they include a relevant use of data and they are easy to understand. I am not talking about creative writing here. We are talking about technical writing. In technical writing, we are able to be specific. In technical writing, we're able to show examples based in reality upon probable change. And in technical writing, please don't use more than four syllables for your words. It just gets tiring. Unless this is a research application where five and six syllables are necessary, it just makes reading them clumsy and awkward. Try to make sure you're using words that almost anybody can understand so that the outcomes are clear. So provide clarity on the priorities that are being addressed and supported. Usually priorities are either internal priorities or external priorities. Examples of internal priorities are agency leadership, department focus, population, and or client concerns, key stakeholders concerns. It may just be one or two people that have said, I keep seeing the same thing happen time and time again, and I wish somebody would do. That's an internal, that's an internal response to change. And then you have organizational capacity as priority. Sometimes you can't do things. External priorities include things like a, a foundation or a government saying, I'll give you the money if. What we're looking for is a partner who will or outside data sources. Um, it seems as though, uh, you know what outside data sources look like. Outside data can drive change because they are trends. Um, we have loan and lending institutions, if that's what's going on within your agency. And of course, there are environmental concerns. If the air is bad, the water is bad, how can you have healthy people? How, how? So that's an external pressure that drives um, grant writers, technical reviewers. I'm moving on very quickly. I'm still in the first part, I can't believe it. Here are some resource development options. You have um, development options that you can consider that can happen at the departmental level. And then you have some that need to occur at the leadership level. Um, at the leadership level, for instance, you cannot do a workplace giving program at the department level. That's strictly up to uh, the leadership of an agency to implement. So now you will see that when it comes to resource development, grant writing is really just a part of it. Um, that's really only up in the programs and departments. You have government grants and you have foundation grants. In addition, you also have things like online contributions, direct mail campaigns, you can do special events, and you can also offer fee for services. Now, these are all at the department level and resource development. At the agency leadership development, you have special board events, planned giving, workplace program, corporate relations, direct contribution, agency loans, lending institutions. So when you get your mix um, over a year, you can say, we're gonna do A and B and Z and Y, and together we're gonna chart them out per quarter and see what goes on. It's planning because, you know, this public health stuff is also a business. And there is assistance to help you and your business succeed because this is about the community. All right, moving on. And this is another workshop, by the way. Let's go to part two, preparing your grant applications for funding and success. Now, this is where I really need you to focus on um, that project that I've asked you to keep up within your mind. A project. We want to talk about how, we want to talk about that project and how that project can affect intentional change over time. Uh, the writer review of the funder, your technical kaka, and um, how to do priorities over tasks. Okay, I'm getting to it. I'm rushing a little bit, um, but I think we're having a we have plenty of time. Intentional change over time. Please, folks, think about how or what do you see. How do you communicate to your funders that you are trying to talk about an intentional change over time? Um, many private foundations, funders, um, especially got upset with some of the language that was appearing in grants. They said, you know, we don't want to be a sponsor. We don't want to just, you know, like be some off the cuff participant, something. We want to develop a relationship. 
because the way that they get their money is different. We're so used to working in a government fashion that um, working with our, with our government uh, partners and funding that we forget that most private funders want to actually be with you and see change instituted within the communities that are there. So they love this thing about tithing. So please, when you work with a private foundation, please focus on intentional change over time. Yeah. Now, um, as, a, as a writer and as a reviewer and the funder, okay, so you have to remember that accurately defining and measuring change indicators is key to any successful grant application. Change indicator, change. How do you know something's changing? This is when you probably have a baseline for it. You probably said, um, we know, okay, for smoking cessation, for smoking, e-cigarettes, tobacco, uh, all kinds of smokeless devices. In New Mexico, one third of, teen, of black teens in New Mexico vape or use some type of tobacco um, or, or nicotine product. Uh, and the thing about vaping versus cigarettes is that the smoke from the, the vapor in vaping addresses our mouth and our dentition, dentition differently than a cigarette does. So we don't even know some of the true impacts or long-term impacts of vaping for another what, 15 years or so. Um, so if 30% of our youth of, of, of our youth are vaping now, what's those health indicators gonna look like 30 years from now? And so how are we gonna get a baseline? Grant reviewers are not required to be imaginative or figure out what you're meant to share. This is why it's very important to really look at your words and make sure that your words and statements are making sense. Not only do you want to define and measure change, you have to be imaginative and be clear. And please, writers, ensure that your application is aligned with the funder's money. This is done by going to their website. I don't know what funder doesn't have a website available. And on it, they tell you what they're funding because they say, these are our priorities. Look for those priorities. Keep your sentences short by remembering the period is a writer's best friend. Run on sentences really hurt applications. In a run-on sentence, you're using so many commas. You're using the word and. You're using semicolons and colons. It is difficult for the writer to determine what is the priority in this sentence. It's like going to a buffet, filling your mouth full of food, and then trying to describe the green beans differently from your uh, protein which might be tofu or it might be chicken or it might be beef. And if, if it's all up in there, it just tastes like um, pie or what's that thing, beef stew? I haven't eaten in years. But anyway, are you eating beef stew? Because that's what a uh, run on sentences tastes mushy. And to you, it may be very comforting. But to the reviewer, I don't know what, I don't know what the focus of the sentence is. Uh, because I have like six other applications to read and I don't know what you're trying to say because you've jumbled everything up in my head. It is best to have shorter sentences, use that period effectively, stay, it's like, it's like taking a bite. When I read your application, I need to have every sentence go in on its own. I do not need to be confused to figure out, am I talking about dessert or am I talking about a main meal or what? I don't want salad, all right? Um, moving on, this is the period of is your writer's best friend. Please remember, technical writers work with words, thoughts, and data. And your technical caca, this is your technical caca. Your technical caca needs to be clear, easily understood by the audience. It needs to be accurate based on factual data. It needs to follow the grammatical technical rules best you can, correct. It needs to be as correct as you can make it. For some people, English is their second or third language. Um, you actually have a leg up because hopefully you'll keep your sentences shorter and clearer um, because uh, 
it really gets confusing with these run on sentences and these long, long sentences. They just kill it for so many agencies. Comprehensive, make sure that all the questions have been addressed, all of them as much as you can. Concise, brevity is a plus. Uh, according to, I think, uh, what was I heard? There's like Google, there, there's like two or three writing sites that, that say your sentences should be no longer than 26 words on average. Uh, on average, if it's over 26 words, you, you might want to consider uh, breaking it up into two sentences, uh, making sure that that is a correct sentence uh, or that you are really conveying the thought or you need to start from scratch and really figure out what you're trying to say. Um, and accessible, follow the technical rules as well as the written. Uh, with the computers these days, we don't have to worry about things so much as like format, like is it APA format or the other API or API APA, it can do it for you. So that's usually taken care of, but that's your technical caca. So your technical caca is still about your words. Uh, it's still about how you use your words. It said that it's just that this is technical writing. So technical writing does require use of data. So here is a logic model. And my Lord, um, again, look at your idea. Logic writers need logic models. Logic models, okay, they tell us what we have. Those are the resources. What we're going to do, those are activities. Outputs are what we get. That's what you can measure. Outcomes are about benefits and impacts relate to time. Okay, now that phrase, intentional change over time. Intentional is based in your activities. You intend to do A, B, C, one, two, three. Intentional, those activities result in benefits or change, which are outcomes. Your activities result in outcomes. The impacts relate to time. When you have an idea that you know is worth funding, please consider dropping that idea into a writer's logic model like this. So you can begin to structure that application so that it, is, it shows intentional change over time. This is going to be part of the packet that you're going to receive once you complete your survey after this, because we want you to be certain of success in your writing style. You're also going to have this VDC checklist that you see in front of you. In it, we share some of the aspects of the vision, design, and capacity. We also have a reminder of what your characteristics of technical writing needs to look like. This is your technical caca. We also relate the vision elements, design elements, and capacity elements to the parts of a grant, to your traditional logic models. And we also kind of encourage you to kind of review and proofread your grant as well. On the bottom, we have the traditional logic model that includes things like your inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes, and impacts, because we want you to get money in your community. We want your grants to be tight, to be comprehensive, to make sense, and address change. Please address change. This is what this is all about. Thank you for your participation. Um, this is pretty much this uh, initial activity that we wanted to be able to present. Um, at this point, uh, there is some more good stuff coming, um, but we have a little bit of time. Part of the good stuff includes not only the written materials, but actual people. And one of the people that you, you have available to you today is actually on the line. Uh, her name is Ms. Marlene Vignet. She's going to share a little bit more about what she, about why she is here, um, what she has to offer, and to um, really encourage you guys to um, look at doing things differently. Marlene, up to you now.
Thank you, Jay, for that introduction. I hope everyone can hear me. Just gonna get ready to share my presentation slides. All right, hope you can see that. Can you? Oh no. Yes, Marlene, we can see you. Okay, great. Thank you, Deborah. Again, thank you, Jay, for the gems of information um, shared in your presentation. The grant writing and resources noted along with that packet will truly be very helpful with all those participating in today's session, as Jay shared. Um, my name is Marlene Vignet, and I serve as your Regional Minority Health Analyst with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services here in um, the Region 2 Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Our regional office covers New Jersey, New York, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as the federally recognized tribes. On behalf of our regional office, just want to thank you again for joining today's session. And I'd like to take a few minutes to share some updates regarding the Office of Minority Health. Okay. The Office of Minority Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is dedicated to improving the health of racial and ethnic minority populations through the development of health policies and programs that will help eliminate health disparities. Just last week at the National League of Cities Conference, Vice President Harris announced $250 million in grants for localities to partner with community organizations on health literacy. The new initiative, Advancing Health Literacy to Enhance Equitable Community Responses to COVID-19, is expected to fund approximately 30 projects in urban communities and 43 projects in rural communities. Cities, counties, parishes, and other similar subdivisions may apply for funding. OMH expects to fund projects in urban and rural communities for two years. The goal of these projects is to provide racial and ethnic minority and underserved communities with information they need to stay safe and to get vaccinated. Lastly, I want to highlight that potential grantees are encouraged to partner with minority serving institutions, including Hispanic serving institutions, for the evaluation component of the project. The application deadline for this funding opportunity is 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on April 20th, 2021. Yes, 6 p.m. on Eastern Standard Time on April 20th. Please visit the Office of Minority Health .hhs.gov website for more information. And lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't share that April is National Minority Health Month. The Office of Minority Health leads National Minority Health Month with the goal, excuse me, with the goal of launching a campaign that yields meaningful engagement and impactful outreach efforts among racial and ethnic minority mm -hmm. and American Indian and Alaska Native communities. Racial and ethnic minority populations are amongst the hardest hit by the pandemic, suffering worse outcomes and higher rates of hospitalizations and deaths. It is vital for all communities, especially those hardest hit by COVID-19 pandemic, to be vaccine ready. And we can do this by getting the facts, sharing accurate information with others, and practicing safe behaviors to slow the spread. We all have a role in helping communities get answers to questions that they may have about the vaccine and to help build understanding and trust among patients, providers, leaders at the national, state, and local levels. The combination of getting vaccinated and following the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC's recommendations to protect ourselves and others will offer the best protection from COVID-19. During National Minority Health Month, OMH and its partners throughout the country invite everyone to tell others why they are vaccine ready and will empower and educate the most vulnerable communities about the importance of getting a COVID-19 vac vaccine as more become available. OMH has created a microsite for National Minority Health Month and there you will have access to a partner toolkit, social media, me social media messaging, excuse me, and downloadable graphics for the vaccine ready campaign as well as access to videos. On April 22nd, OMH will host a virtual town hall, and I'll be sure to share details with Deborah to pass along with all those participating in today's session. Engaging organizations and individuals in supporting Vaccine Ready will help make the nation safe and move us closer to ending the epidemic. 
and ensuring families and communities can return to gathering and enjoy each other's company. Thank you again for allowing me to share these updates. I encourage you to visit the minorityhealth.hhs.gov website for more information about the health literacy funding opportunity, the National Minority Health Month 2021 campaign, and additional resources and health initiatives that may be of interest to your program and outreach efforts. If you have any questions regarding the information I provided or like to learn more about our regional office or the Office of Minority Health, here is my contact information, Marlene Vignet, marlene.vignet at hhs.gov. I also included contact information for the Office of Minority Health Resource Center. And the Resource Center offers a variety of information and resources, including access to online documents, collections, databases, and funding searches, and customized responses to requests for information. You can learn more about these services on the OMH website. Here, there's a the toll-free number, 1-800-444-6472. And you can also email info at minorityhealth, all one word, dot hhs.gov. Thank you again, and I look forward to hearing from you. Deborah, I will turn it back to you for the Q&A segment. Thank you so much. I don't know about you guys, but um, thumbs up um, to my two fabulous presenters. Your insight and your pearls of wisdom have been phenomenal. I think if I walk away with anything, one of the things is, is to ensure that we read those instructions, follow those instructions, and make sure that we are reviewing those RFAs and highlighting them and pulling out the things that are most critical. Um, so I really wanna thank the two of you for really taking the time and energy uh, to share. What I'd like to be able to do is um, if you'd like, we can put the questions in the chat or um, if you have a question, if there is something uh, that you'd like to ask either one of our presenters, um, I'm happy to unmute you um, because again, this is um, the beginning of our skills building. We will be doing additional uh, workshops as we move forward that include things like how to do logic models, uh, evaluations, um, really being able to provide sort of the base uh, information that we need to be able to continue to work in our communities. Do I see any hands? I have lots of, I'd love to ask a few questions. Um, sure, where do I have somebody that is looking here? I'll ask you to unmute. There you go. You have the floor. Hello. Hi, um, thank you very much for, um, for coming and helping to host this event. Um, so I just have a couple of questions. Um, so does, do, you, do you guys have any tips for like first grant, like people writing grants for the first time, um, especially people who aren't like a part of an agency, like they're just doing this like independently? Yeah. Um... I'll start, Molly, did you wanna go or can I just jump in? Go for it, okay, yeah. For uh, first grant writer, uh, thank God you are here. Uh, we uh, definitely want you to be involved in, in, this, in these activities. Um, find an agency that you really get with. And what I mean by that is that you should really like their mission and you should really want them to get money. Um, it's because most grants are not given to individuals. Most grants in our area are only to organizations. If you're looking at an individual grant, that's like a grant for an artist or a grant for the humanities. In public health, um, services are usually accountable to an agency. So that's what I would start. And really, um, we, it's like you can also uh, find really easy grants to cut your teeth on, uh, which are usually state grants. Um, also, you can really cut your teeth on a foundation grant. 
we have another question. Thank you for that question. Oh, I'm sorry, was there a follow-up to that? No, I have a question. Uh, yes, go ahead. My, my name is Joe Andrews. I wanted to know, do you guys, um, with the grant writing, do you guys offer grants to uh, uh, Greek organizations like fraternities and sororities? Uh, because um, some of the sorority, well, my wife's sorority, they have young um, roars young teenagers that's in the organization that um once they get uh leave out of the roars group at a certain age they go on to college and so they have a you know programs where you know it, it helps you know to fund scholarship programs i mean scholarship money for those roars uh young roars that's going to college so do you guys offer grants to uh sorority uh, and Greek organizations? Um, actually, um, the Greek organizations are necessary partners in health. Um, the Greeks were initially founded to be of community service. They're supposed to be about community service. Um, and as long as a Greek um, keeps that focus on its activities, it can almost certainly apply for a grant. Um, and again, that same idea about partnering with an agency that, that the Greeks really support their mission and vision because a lot of um, Greek uh, chapters aren't able to uh, maintain the capacity that's needed to work a grant throughout the year. If they do have that capacity, then they should have no problem applying on their own. Otherwise, I would really suggest that they partner with an existing agency that they can show a clear outcome that can show benefit to the community and the youth that are being involved. Great way to really get our youth involved early. And I Thank echo you for what that Jay question. just. Oh, sorry, sorry Deborah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, I echo what Jay has shared in regarding internship and fellowship opportunities. Um, several of these organizations do offer those opportunities starting with high school, middle school, high school youth, all the way to postdoctoral um, fellowship opportunities. So it's really just, as Jay mentioned in his presentation, really learning about the organization, the funding organization, what opportunities they have listed and what their partnerships look like and seeing if there's opportunities to help support youth development and growth. Thank you for that question. Jennifer, There, uh, I see you have your hand raised. Would you unmute so you can ask your question? I'm unmuted, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I just wanted to sort of follow up on that question. Um, would you um, say it for those grant applications to focus more on like a program of the club or just asking for funding for the organization? I wonder if that makes sense. So club-based, organization-based versus program-based. Mm -hmm. Is there a preference? Is there, a, and I'm sorry if I missed it, I'm at work, so I'm sort of multitasking. No, 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 you're, you're on it. Those, I mean, those, because it's like, frankly, there is money out there for each of those categories. There is money out there just to build a, a program's development. So, you know, really look at what the instructions of, the, of that grant are. Because if you are saying, you know, we, we want money, that's one thing but say we want money to do is another. And again, there's money for each of those categories. That would be more so foundation money. Foundation money is really good for developing an agency, making sure that it has its direction, its mission, its focus together, that it can like, you know, do its networking, build its impact in the community. That's foundation money. Government money is we have something to do. And what we want to do is, that's when you go to the government money. Um, when you look at your funding mix, foundations are able to apply to uh, assist your agency quickly within the community. When you're looking at government money or you know, taxpayer money, that is a more measured approach to change. You know, they don't respond quickly because they have to get approval from A and B and C and D. 
foundation money is much more forgiving for a new agency. Thank you so much. I appreciate that clarification. That was necessary. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have another question from, please excuse me if I mispronounce your name, Yolo? Yes, it's Yolo. Oh. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's Yolo. Um, so I have two questions. One sure. is, my church is doing a lot of outreach um, in the community. Um, our church is good, I guess you could say, organizations for grant money. Um, do organizations typically give grant money to churches? And my second question is um, about finding grants. I know a lot of the databases, like you have to be a member and they're quite costly. What are some ways for, I guess you could say, newbie grant writers to find um, grants, um, like I guess various databases or where to search for those grants? Marlene, you wanna go for it? I know you know this. <laughs> Well, um, thank you for your question. Um, for newly for a new entity, I would encourage you to reach out to the Office of Minority Health Resource Center. Let them know what is the health topic or area you're trying to research, and you're looking for grant opportunities that pertain to that. You could also share with them what is your target population and what health initiative you're looking to achieve. They'll help craft a search um, results that will help you kind of identify different funding opportunities. In addition to looking at um, the OMH, the Office of Minority Health Resource Center, back to Jay's point, it's really just exploring your state and local health department, department sites to see what funding opportunities are available. There's also local organizations and national coalitions that you can kind of look at to see what funding opportunities are available. And if you need assistance to kind of navigate that, the resource center is really helpful. And I'm helpful too, if you want to have a side conversations to see, to identify some other opportunities. Jay, can I jump in around the houses of worship? Please. Um, so having had some experience working with houses of worship across the country, Yes, as a nonprofit, you can apply uh, for funding, but if you talk to your accountant, they will probably suggest that that house of worship establish uh, a nonprofit so that that money becomes separate from uh, the house of worship and your foundation money. Um, it can get a bit messy um, sometimes if you are mixing um, the house of worship money with your foundation or government or grant money, um, but it has been done. But I would strongly suggest that your deacons board, um, your pastor, uh, faith leader, consult with an accountant who understands nonprofit uh, accounting and also understands um, how the congregation's accounts are set up to ensure that there is no commingling of money or that there are any problems that could arise forward. Jay, you can speak to that more, but I just wanted to share that piece. Uh, and I don't think I could add anything to what you just shared because it is down to the period correct. Um, I do want to add another place to search for funding, search for money is your public library. Your public library mm -hmm. is able to conduct interlibrary loans so that you can gain access to the Foundation Center online. The Foundation Center online. Yes, you definitely want to go to OMHRC, the OMH Resource Center, um, because they are a great partner to have. They can really clue you into a lot of what is happening. But to find some of those foundation grants, the public library, try there. And I think also because you're at, at City University, you can also use their library as well uh, to uh, do to do grant searches. There are always people in the resource section to help you do that. Get ready to just spend some time because there's a lot, a lot of money out there. 
Before we go to our next question by uh, from Susanna Paul, I would ask that you please go into the chat. There is a link in there for the survey. It's really important that you guys complete that for us because it helps us do our planning going forward and we are able to support the work that you most need and what's important to you in terms of as we are continuing to develop more skills building webinar. Uh, Suzanne Paul, if you'd like to ask your question. Yes, um, I just wanna say thank you. This was really cool. I believe this is the first time I ever heard like um, grants and resource development from an Afrocentric lens. So I appreciate Jay for sharing that. And I just wanna encourage the first time um, grant writers and people who are doing research. Um, when I graduated from college, this was back in 2005, I worked for Boston Children's Hospital. And the first project I ever had was to manage a $300,000 grant with no experience. I was just told be creative by my supervisor. And I ended up um, creating programs that I would manage, but that taught me about public private sector funding. So looking at your local banks to see what they provide for community organizations, because I was focused on positive youth development and uh, eliminating healthcare disparities. And it was by Citizens Bank. And ever since then, from that first experience, I always look to the private sector to see who funds what. So you look at the organizations that you admire and you see who they have partnered with. It's kind of like reverse engineering. So I just want to let you know that like anything's possible um, because there are a lot of resources out there, especially for black and brown businesses, because that's what I focus on um, right now is helping businesses, the private sector, go after grants instead of loans. So thank you and all the best. Suzanne, thank you for that. You know, you reminded me about something too. Um, you can also, from your very own computer at home, put these words into your search engine to look for grants. Common grant application, and then put your state, and then put it whatever state you're located in. Common grant application, then your state. And what will pop up is there's this thing that funders use called a common grant application, meaning that 16, 17, 100 funders will use the same application for you to apply for a whole bunch of money. And uh, that's how you get to it. That's how you find it. Um, there were also, so Susan, that's why I wanted to thank you so much because you reminded me of that very fact. Kudos to you, my dear. Thank you so much. So seeing that um, we are a minute out, um, I would like to again, thank both of our presenters uh, for sharing their time, their energy and their talents. But most of all, I wanna thank you all for taking the time and joining us today. Thank you for caring for our community. Thank you for showing up and showing out. Um, as you complete the survey in about an hour or so when the recording is up, I will send out all of the materials along with the PowerPoints and both Marlene and Jay's contact information um, so that we can continue the dialogue and ensure that we're doing the best that we can for our communities. Again, please take the time to just fill out our quick survey. We appreciate it. Um, I and I just wanna thank you all very much. Jay, Marlene, are there any closing words? Uh, can I make a quick comment? I wasn't able to get on the Zoom. Um, I had to dial in so I couldn't see anything um, because I logged into the Zoom, but I tried to put the password in, mm -hmm. but I had to dial in from my state. And so I, I'm listening through everything so I can't, see everybody, I can only hear the information. Just, just email me and I will be happy to share all of that information with you, not a problem. Can you tell me your email address? Uh, sure, it is uh, Deborah, D-E-B-O-R-A-H dot L-E-V as in Victor, I-N-E at C-U-N-Y dot S-P-H dot 
edu. Thank you. And so again, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, we will send out this post. We will send out all of the um, presentation materials. And once again, I will hang back just to make sure that folks have an opportunity to fill out the survey. But thank you, be well, be safe, and most of all, be good to yourselves. Thank you. Hey, Deborah, you said you were hanging back. Uh, is the presentation over or? Yes, I'm sorry. The presentation is over, yes. I'm just leaving it open. Um, so if anyone needs to complete their survey, they, are, um, they can do that without having to wait for the email to come. OK. Is the um, CUNY public health program online, or do you have to be on campus? Do you all have a hybrid? Um, yes, we have a hybrid. Question. And yes, we have a master's and a doctoral program, all of which can be accessed um, both in person and online. Currently, we are just online, but um, hopefully in the fall, we will be back in a hybrid um, offering. Gotcha. Feel free to okay. reach out to me. I'll be happy to connect I you. Will. Please do. Thank you. And thank you guys for this. This was an awesome presentation, like very information field that you can actually get it and actually use it. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Okay, thanks.